Once again, it's just impressive, the, the people that we bring on this show. I'm so impressed. So we have Dr. Rana Parsa, who's an orthopedic surgeon uh, down in, in sunny L.A. She lives in Manhattan Beach, which was one of my old stomping grounds. So it was great to talk with her. She had the absolute chutzpah to set up a solo practice in Los Angeles, no partners, right in Manhattan Beach, surrounded by Curlin Job, Cedar sinai Kaiser Permanente. Really unbelievable. She's got this really cool stem cell gig going on cryogenics, where she'll literally take your stem cells and freeze them, waiting for the FDA to give sort of a longer term approval for cartilage cells. But she's this whole molecular biology degree of her. She's talking about using it for potentially leukemia and CTE and just got a lot of great stuff going on. She's a super fun guest. I really like this episode. You're going to love it, too. I am really excited. We're taking a little pivot here at the Ortho Show, and we're bringing you now Pitch Pro. We have an amazing group of panelists. Think of it sort of like a shark tank for orthopedics. Joe Mullings, Vin Dasa, the Fro, and the bearded one, Matthew Ray Scott, on a panel where medical device and pharma companies come in to pitch their story. We listen. We talk. We provide advice, and it is a hoot. We have amazing personalities. We provide amazing counsel and advice uh, to these groups. We are having a lot of fun. You guys are going to love it. Pitch Pro by The Ortho Show. From Medical Media, this is The Ortho Show. Hello, world. It's your favorite opioid sparing orthopedic surgeon, Dr. Scott Sigmund, here to host another episode of the Ortho Show podcast, where we bring you the best of the best in the orthopedic space. We are heading back to Southern California, where I am so jealous. My old stomping grounds in Manhattan Beach. We have Dr. Rana Parsa, who's on with us today, is an orthopedic surgeon, sports medicine, as well as regenerative medicine specialist. Uh, in Manhattan Beach, which is one of my old time stomping grounds for my times at Curlin Job. Ron, it's a pleasure to have you on. How are you? I'm good. Thank you so much for having me. We miss you over here. Yeah, I know. It's, uh, I remember I came out like pre pandemic almost like two and a half years ago, and I was given a talk, and you happened to come out too. So we got to meet you that night, which was awesome. Well, before the Ortho Show podcast, but I was, uh, always sort of thinking of you and the cool things that you're doing and the way in which you practice. So I thought it would be awesome to have you on. So thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Thanks for having me. So 625 Esplanade. Does that sound familiar to you? It's not too far. It's the <laughs> Is other that where I used to live? <laughs> exactly where I used to live. So in my year for Curly Job in 1995, but I'll never forget it. You know, I, I drove cross country and I was like, you know, look, if I'm driving cross country with all this stuff, there's no way that I'm not going to like live on the ocean. And it just went back and forth and just found this condo and it was just perfect. And this two bedroom condo, we literally had a deck and a porch that overlooked the Pacific Ocean. It was unbelievable. Just miss those times so much. Lucky you. (laughs) Yeah, I grew up here, so I always wanted to get back here. So that's pretty much all my plans have maneuvered me back to this area. Uh, that's awesome. I mean, I remember like uh, Jim Taboni had this beautiful house in Manhattan Beach. I'm sure he probably still does for all I know. And so he would invite the fellows over and we would do beach bo- volleyball. And, and then there was a strand and we would go from the strand all the way back, you know, to to uh, was it to not, not to Monterey, but what's it, to Marina Del Rey. We hung out there every Rey. day. Oh, just such amazing. Things. <laughs> lucky you. Lucky you. <laughs> You can come visit I anytime. Will. I promise, I promise. We've got so many good friends out there for sure. So we always like to start from the beginning. And if I if I did my research correctly, I think you come from a family of doctors. But when did the the sort of the, the clue for you that medicine and then orthopedics was the direction that you wanted to go? Uh, as far as medicine, I think that's probably what I've always wanted to do. If you ask like my aunts and uncles, they always say that like when you were in second grade, all you said you wanted to do was be a doctor. And I think that came from, you know, being with my dad growing up, going to the hospital with my dad, who is a pathologist, actually. And so I'd spend a lot of time in the lab with him. And I thought it was so cool. And he just, you know, his 
love for taking care of patients and helping people really intrigued that in me. And I just kind of naturally followed that path. Um, as far as orthopedics goes, there's actually no other orthopedic surgeons in my family. And I've always loved sports, sports medicine. I've played a lot of sports throughout my life, but the sports medicine population was always um, something that intrigued me. And it wasn't really till my first year in medical school when I did my muscle skeletal course that I really um, kind of clung on to orthopedic surgery. And then I did a rotation or I shadowed an orthopedic surgeon uh, between my first and second year of medical school. And that kind of solidified my decision that I really wanted to go into orthopedics. Yeah. So that's a common theme for sure. You know, the, the immediate healers that we are and the ability to take care of patients and, uh, and really demonstrably make a difference for them, you know, with the, with the treatments that we do. So, you know, you're, so you decide it's going to be medical school and you, you just, you just can't get out of California I mean, initially. Right? So you go to, so you go to college, you go to medical school uh, and then you head out to Chicago for your residency. And then, you head on and do a sports fellowship with one of the all-time icons in the history of sports medicine, Jim Andrews. So you have to have some incredibly unique stories from your time in fellowship. <laughs> I'd love to hear. Definitely. That was a, you know, once in a lifetime experience, so many great opportunities. I'm so thankful for my time there and everything I learned and experienced. So was he, so this was, well, this was about five years ago. Is that right? I graduated fellowship 2017, so about, yeah, almost four or five years ago, 2016, 2017. That's when I was, was there. Was he taking care of the Washington Redskins at that time? Was he flying up from Florida to take care of the Redskins for game day? Yeah, he was. We got to go up with him. We'd alternate. The fellows would kind of switch off which one went with him. So we had experiences in that. We did, you know, went with him to the Tampa Bay Rays uh, spring training. We got to do the physicals there. Um, He was doing, you know, Alabama, Auburn University and some other colleges around there. So we got to do that. But really, everyone was flying in to see him that needed to see him um, for, you know, tertiary care, kind of the more complex stuff. Yeah, so it's fascinating. So he has this sort of destination practice, right? Which is which is away from all of these places. And I'm I'm assuming he's just flying around in his private plane, running around from you know for game coverage back and forth to all these cool places. What a what a cool experience and fellowship. Yeah, I definitely have never been on so many private planes in my life during that one. <laughs> kind of spoiled me, but it's okay. <laughs> it was yeah. a very awesome experience. I know commercial sucks. What are you gonna do? <laughs> Uh, one day old, yeah one day exactly <laughs> hashtag yeah, goals <laughs> that's great I mean I, one of my favorite memories for fellowship is that we took care of the the Dodgers and uh so they would fly us out to um to Vero Beach and we spend an entire week there in Dodger mm-hmm. town and so you know you just hung out with the players and there's this little golf course that you could play they gave you a pager and then when people need to be seen it was just like just this amazing experience of uh being able to take care of all these amazing athletes and learn so much from, from these giants of medicine, you know, for me, it was Frank Job and, and the rest of the crew and uh, just phenomenal, phenomenal time in my life, which I'll never forget. I'm sure the same for you. Picked up some good tidbits from him. <laughs> oh yeah. Amazing ability to, uh, techniques and things as well. So, so then you come up with this, this really, this, this great idea. You're like, all right, listen, I'm from Los Angeles, right? I'm going to go back to Los Angeles. There's no real competition in LA. I'm just going to set up my own practice. And that, I mean, what kind of, what kind of what's going on that, you know? And I think if I'm not mistaken, you're in solo practice, right? Yeah, I am a solo practitioner. I'm my private practice here. Um, I always wanted to come back here. So I started by, you know, sharing space with an older guy in Redondo Beach and, I basically set up my shingle, if you will. I would go like door to door to the different like medical offices in our building, introduce myself. I formed what we call the, uh, or what I like to call the old man alliance of the South Bay. So I befriended all the older orthopedic surgeons that weren't, you know, um, doing arthroscopy or complex shoulder um, procedures. So they would start referring their more complex things to me and their more complex sports cases to me. And I just slowly 
you know, built my practice, I definitely learned a lot my first year. I made a lot of mistakes my first year. I lost a lot of money my first year. And then I got introduced to another orthopedic surgeon in Manhattan Beach, Dr. Jacobetti, um, through Arthrex, actually. And um, he was so busy that he needed, you know, someone to take some of his cases. So I stayed at independent uh, as a solo practitioner, but um, started doing the complex cases he didn't want to do either and started slowly building my practice. So 2018, you know, was a little better, 2019, a little better and baby steps forward. I've just been kind of building on it and developing it in the way that I want it to be. Yeah, that's interesting. You sort of carve out a niche. I mean, I, you know, you got <laughs> Santa Monica Orthopedic Group around the corner with Tom Knapp, Burt Mandelbaum, mm-hmm. Ravine Bodab, or Michael Gerhardt. And then you got Curly Job with Neil Elitraj, Taboni, and that whole crew. And then you got Kaiser Permanente around the corner. You got Ron Navarro and that whole crew. But I guess, you know, LA is big enough that if you, you know, you establish yourself, you carve out a niche. But I still got, I have so many questions. I'm like, like what are you, are you on call every night? I mean, what are you doing? It's crazy. No, actually, uh, you won't believe this, but I don't take any call anymore. I used to take call. My first couple of years, I definitely took call um, at two hospitals, a little company in Torrance Memorial. So I was doing, you know, general orthopedics for the most part, collecting my cases for board collection. Um, I do go to a couple of like outside clinics um, as well. So it's not just my Manhattan Beach office, but I go to a couple offices um, in different areas of town, Downey, Long Beach, and basically collect the patients there and bring them back to the surgery center. <laughs> so it's definitely took some time to develop, but it's going well. And and do you take call for your patients every night since you're not on call for the ER? Call's just not that bad? With the other older orthopedic surgeons that are solo practice in the area, they have formed kind of a call group. So we have a, you know, outpatient call group. So we, you know, switch off taking call and um, things like that. But, you know, most of my patients are outpatient procedures and with Wi-Fi, anywhere I go, I can, you know, text my office back and staff back whenever they have a question. And, you know, if something's really bad, I'll send them to the ER. Thank God, knock on wood, I haven't had to do that. But, you know, that's always an option. And there's a lot of support around here, which is great. So then you must be an owner or a partner in a surgery center that's nearby so you can get the cases done. Yeah, so I've been operating at Manhattan Beach Surgery Center, and now that I'm officially board certified, which was postponed a year because of COVID, um, I am working on starting my own surgical center. Um, we call, we just got you know our Secretary of State of California registration. We're going to call it the Manhattan Beach Surgical Institute. Nice, good for you. So I, I still have so many questions. <laughs> You only, op- you only operate on healthy people. I mean, what about the sick people that need to be done at a hospital? What do you do? What do you do with them? Well, I do have block time at the hospital, so I do take my cases to the hospital like once a month. I have my block time, so I stack all my bigger cases, all my more complex cases. My I still do total joints. I do total knees, total shoulders. So I'll do my joints there. I do go to the hospital once a month, but most of the time it's in the outpatient center. That's great. And no call. I'm so jealous. But it's okay. If, if for me too, they, they don't let me work on broken bones anymore either. I'm too old. They tell me, yeah, we'll take the call. I got lots of younger partners, but not at four years out. I was definitely still taking call. All right. So so I, one of the other things which I think is pretty cool, which we definitely have to talk about, you know, you have, you're one of the new breed and the new breed is we're not just going to operate on you, but we have other alternative solutions that can help for your patients as well. So I know you're a big believer in regenerative medicine. We've had, uh, you know, some amazing guests on the show that are, so the you know, sort of the leaders, you know, Steve Sampson, uh, uh, Don Buford, et cetera, that, that really are leaders in the regenerative medicine field. But there's something that you do, which is quite unique. And I want to hear the whole story. And that is you developed a relationship with Dr. Kayong Saw out of Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. And for many of your professional athletes that you care for, other people that are interested, I, I guess you're retrieving stem cells and then freezing them for later use. So that's fascinating to me. And I know our listeners are going to want to hear all about that. How did you develop the relationship? Who's the typical patient? What's the process? Tell us the whole thing. And my mother's listening. You got to be able to tell, say so my mother understands. Okay, perfect. So 
Um, I developed the relationship actually through the Andrews Institute when I was doing my fellowship. So they set up a phase three FDA trial there to replicate Dr. Saw's study um, to regenerate cartilage uh, using autologous stem cells. They did it through a different procedure. They would use apheresis to harvest cells after nupogen injection. And then they were treating the lesions with a micro drilling and then repeated uh, stem cell injections, um, bone marrow aspirate injections that were frozen into different aliquots and given through different points of time. So I was there when that trial began um, it's still underway there, uh, but I developed a relationship with Dr. Saw because I was working with Dr. Anz over at the Andrews Institute. And after I graduated fellowship, uh, he and I told him I was going on a you know month long graduation trip to Asia, and he's like, "You should come to Malaysia and see my facility." So I was like, "That would be awesome." So I did spend some time there with him and his amazing team. They were so awesome. They taught me so much about the procedures. I was able to see his facilities. I was able to, you know, see his patients' progress. He had, you know, MRIs there. So he was constantly taking MRIs. I learned his techniques, his protocols. Um, and although that kind of stuff isn't allowed in the U.S. yet, we can harvest your stem cells and bank them uh, for later use. So I'm hoping, you know, in five, 10 years when that, um, th that study is replicated and we have the approval from the FDA that we'll be able to use your harvested frozen um, cryogenically preserved uh, bone marrow aspirate to uh, help regenerate cartilage. So I was talking to, again, luckily I have a great team here with Arthrex, the biologics team from Arthrex. I was telling them all about my research and they're like, you guys, you should meet this company, Forever Labs. Forever Labs is a stem cell banking company. They freeze, cryogenically freeze the bone marrow aspirate. I was like, okay, cool. So I met with them and they're more of a longevity company. So they know that as we age, the number and the quality of your stem cells diminishes, which is why we accrue age-related diseases. So they harvest the cells, they freeze them in the hopes that they will eventually be reintroducing them to your system. The PhD behind the company, uh, Mark Katakowski, he does about 10, 15 years of research for brain trauma, dementia, um, concussion treatments using stem cells, stroke, different brain pathologies, and working with them has been great. And it gave me the idea like, wow, okay, I'm in the orthopedic world. I'm looking at these athletes who are going through, you know, the NFL really, we saw mainly at Andrews, terrible arthritis by the age of 30, 40, you know, they need joint replacements in a way earlier than the normal population. But they also have, you know, this huge issue with CTE, brain trauma, um, traumatic brain injury concussion. So I was like, it'd be so cool to be able to connect this company with the patients, the professional athletes. So I cultivated some of my relationships that I made at the Andrews Institute, mainly with the NFL Trust, um, the captains of the NFL Trust and directors of the NFL Trust, uh, which the trust is basically was organized to help take care of the medical costs that the, the players have after they retire. So it's a trust that was set up about six, seven years ago. And it's kind of like the workers comp of NFL, uh, the trust that covers it. So I've been working with them. We trying to get more athletes kind of interested in this to harvest and save their bone marrow, not only for hopeful eventual use to maybe, you know, regenerate their cartilage, but also, you know, potentially to help prevent or decrease the sequelae of repetitive traumatic brain injuries. All right. So that's awesome. I mean, this is like almost like Star Trek, something in the future. You know, I think of cryogenics and I think of like movies and freezing people and then they come back to life later on. But I think it's really amazing. So the, you're waiting for the technology to sort of catch up and hopefully get the FDA clearance. And in the meanwhile, uh, what you're doing is you're taking these athletes, you're doing a bone marrow aspect, you're sticking a needle into the pelvis, taking out these stem cells, you're sending it to this lab that you have a relationship with, and they freeze it. And then the hopes is you'll come back at a time when you can drill small little holes into the area where the cartilage is missing, 
and put those stem cells back into place. And then it, even more cool, maybe there's going to be some, some research that comes out that stem cells may help with, with the concussion protocols or the chronic of the CTE disease that they're getting as well. So that's pretty darn cool. I love it. Yeah, it's cool to think about the, you know, right now FDA allows us to do point of care injections so I can harvest the cells, get the um, the cell population that we'd like, and then re-inject it at the point of care. Um, but the precedence was set with cord blood storage that we can freeze them and uh, save them for later use. Uh, we also know that with leukemia, and different treatments since the 80s, they've been using bone marrow transplants to treat these patients. So um, that precedence has been set as well. We know through research that the stem cells have a honing mechanism back to your bone marrow after reintroduction. So although, you know, there's about a thousand FDA trials going on right now in the U.S. regarding stroke, heart attack, at John Hopkins, there's, you know, things relating to brain injury at Stanford, all these um, uh, protocols are being developed to use these stem cells. And we know you are your own best donor. So if you had, you know, like knock on wood, no one develops any leukemia or cancer, but after chemo, you could technically use your own stem cells to do your transplant and you wouldn't have any reaction because it is your own cells and you wouldn't have to be on chronic immunosuppressive therapy because of that also. So there's a whole lot of potential there. I was a molecular biology major in college and, you know, it just makes sense to me. To me, this is kind of the future of medicine and I see it happening. And yeah, there's still a lot of work to be done and a lot to figure out, but I definitely see the potential for it. And I definitely um, am excited for the future of medicine. Well, first and foremost, I mean, I love that you're following the FDA and, and you're in that path. I mean, we hear so many wackadoodles out there that are getting fooled, whether it's by the, the manufacturers or whatnot, but they're not paying attention to the details and they're using things that are that are not cleared by the FDA for specific use within the human body. Uh, so thrilled to hear that you're following that process. And I always say, I mean, as much as I would love that, you know, autologous, you know, whether it be BMAC or PRP is one day going to be paid by by, by insurance companies right now, it's really a self-pay model because it hasn't been proven yet from for, for their liking. Uh, but I do think that one the way it's going to way it's going to work its way into commercial payment is through an FDA model, going through the FDA clearance, really doing the appropriate studies, the clinical studies that are necessary to show your efficacy and your safety. And then I think the insurance companies will come on. So there is hope in the future that these really amazing, cool things uh, will be covered by insurance. But for now, it's pioneers like yourself that are pushing the envelope, uh, sitting back, waiting for those opportunities, but also still giving individual patients that have that option a, a great one. So is it all pretty much word of mouth that you're really, you know, getting, uh, you know, your, your, your patients and athletes that are coming in at this time? Through the NFL Trust also, they had a contract with Exos, um, the rehab center that was at Dr. Andrews Institute, and they have a couple of huge facilities around the country, including the sub Help Center here in LA and San Diego, and all, there's a few others. So I met with them when I was at Andrews Institute. I met, you know, some of the hire people up. They developed a new center here at the Lakers training facility also. So when I moved here, I got introduced to the people, the physical therapists really, and the athletic trainers that are involved in the Exos here, um, either at StubHub or at the Lakers training facility. And, you know, we've kind of worked together. And if there's a patient that's interested in this kind of regenerative medicine or that process, uh, they come to see me and we can, you know, discuss it and figure out what's the best treatment plan for them. Love it. Love it. Love it. So, you know, interesting. And I'm, I'm a big sort of branding guy, you know, social media is super important to me to get messages out. We always talk to, to the brand of the individual orthopedic surgeons that come on and, and most are able to, you know, very specifically articulate it. But when I look at your website and your persona amongst like the, the, the local magazines and the media stuff that you're doing, I almost get a sense that it's like a salon-like feel 
you know, within your within your office, all of the all of your staff members are dressed impeccably. And it seems like a, a really soothing, cool place. And I'm sure that's not by accident. But, you know, to give a suggestion to you're only four years into practice, you're really starting to take off at this point. So, you know, what would be your suggestion to the listeners as they're trying to develop, you know, their personal or professional brand uh, within orthopedics? So I definitely took a lot of Dr. Andrews advice to heart. One thing he always said was you got to crawl before you walk, before you run. And although I've developed these ideas of what I really want my future facility to look like and be like and, you know, what we can provide our patients, we really are taking baby steps towards that direction. And it does take time. And I've been discouraged before, like, what am I doing with my life? Why did I choose this path for my life? And, you know, you just stick with it. And it's baby steps moving forward. As long as you're moving forward in that direction, it takes time. Another thing he always set harps on is, you know, it takes years to build a rela- uh, a reputation and 15 minutes to destroy it. So really your reputation you got to take time to build it. You got to be, you know, very cognizant of how you portray yourself. Uh, and now with social media, I mean, it's, it just goes off if you do the wrong thing, say the wrong thing. So, you know, it's baby steps in that direction too. building a reputation takes a long time. And I, you have to be patient. You got to put in that time and kind of just go in that direction and, you know, be be wary that you could, you know, very easily destroy it with the wrong thing. I, honestly, when I talk to my patients, I'm like, not a good salesperson at all. I'll sometimes even talk them out of BMAC because I'll be like, well, there's not really any research going on and this and that. But like this, this is what it shows. The, I present the studies. I give them my opinion. And then we make a joint decision on what the best treatment option is for them. Sometimes it is regenerative medicine. Sometimes it's surgery. You know, like sometimes I tell them straight up they're a joint replacement is a very reliable procedure that take care of your pain and re, you know, and state the joint space. And some of them are like, yeah, you're right. And some of them are like, no, let's try whatever you got before I go into joint replacement. And I give them all the options. We work as a team to figure out what's the best for them. And we go in that direction. So I don't want to, you know, and I, I probably charge the least amount as most people in this area or in the country do. And that's because I just don't feel right taking advantage of people if those research hasn't proven it. And if they want to try it, great, but I'm not going to gouge them, you know, just to make a buck when I really i am in it for the long run. And I want to develop that reputation among the community that I care about them and I want them to get better. I'll never forget a taxi ride. I landed in Vegas for one of the meetings I was going to, and the taxi driver saw I was an orthopedic surgeon. I'm like I'm like NASCAR when I'm traveling. You know, I've got billboards all over me about all the stuff I do, but I can't help myself. But she's like, "Oh yeah, doc. You know, I just had my stem cells done, and you know, I'm feeling really good. I had both of my knees done. They only charged me five thousand a knee, so it was ten thousand. But you know, I took out my home equity loan, and I'm feeling really good about it. And I'm like, oh my, oh my God, God, please tell I me know. who is the person that's doing that to this person? How are they allowing that to happen? And I don't know how you sleep at night. Honestly, I heard the same. Like one of my patients, like, oh yeah, I went down the street, got paid eight thousand dollars to get this injection. Like, eight thousand dollars? Like who is charging this much? And did they get it from your pelvis? No. Then they're calling it stem cells. What are they actually injecting into you? I like, it drives me nuts. I'm really glad, you know, that all that stuff that just happened May 31st, where the FDA shut down all the, you know, injectables, uh, amnion injectables in the US, which actually like, it, it sucks for my older patients that are, you know, 75 plus or on a bunch of medications, because I did actually see benefit in those injections for them. But, you know, it's just wild, wild west out here. People are charging arm and a leg for these injections that, you know, really shouldn't be charged that much. And I'm like kind of glad that they shut down all these, you know, quack or whatever you call it. Yeah, well, I mean, I think with the pandemic and all, they got, they, they sort of came out robustly, which is wonderful. But, you know, to our listeners, the most important thing that we can tell you is to just to do your research, make sure the person that you're going to is reputable. Make sure that they they can demonstrate to you the studies that have been done and, and so that you're feeling comfortable. You can do your reviews online as well. Please make sure. And then if you're doing this, it's because, you know, 
you, you have the money set aside and it's, it's something that you're finding for a reputable doctor to take good care of you. So, you know, I really appreciate the story. I mean, and I mean, I like how you talk about, you know, the initial phases of your practice and, and, and that's great advice and counsel that you gave to our listeners and, you know, critical mass for a practice takes a long time, right. To the point where, you know, you're the person and that's where everybody wants to go. And it can take, you know, 15, 20 years and you continue to evolve in your practice as does the technology as well. So you need to maintain that as you're, you know, as you move forwards and, and age with your patients as well. But no, that's all. That was great advice. And we, we appreciate that for our listeners too. And I want to end with sort of one other thing that I think you have passion for, and that's your mission and volunteer work. You really uh, make a note of that on your website and just, just tell us about where that passion comes from and, and what the, some of the cool things that you're doing and what your plans are in the future. Yeah. So I guess I've kind of always been involved in some sort of volunteer work, whether it's community or international. Um, and before medical school, you know, it was cool to go and see and, and watch doctors work. And then when I was actually in residency, um, I had a couple great opportunities to one go, I worked with the Silver Service Children's Foundation. They would go biannually to, down to Columbia and we would do, you know, um, surgical interventions for child deformities like club feet. And that was really cool because surgery in that sense really, well, in any sense, changes that person's life from that point on. And then I got a traveling fellowship with um, health volunteers overseas uh, during residency as well, where I was really placed in a residency program in Nicaragua, and I was able to teach the residents there, you know, the principles we take for granted because it's so easily taught here. We have such great education system here. There, their orthopedic residency is three years. They're learning all this stuff from a English-based book, not even in their primary language, and they're just, you know, throwing things together, and it's kind of, you know, it was a great opportunity to, you know, teach Amanda fish so they can fish for themselves. Um, that kind of stuff really made an impact on me and hopefully made an impact on them because I feel like I, that really makes a difference um, from that point forward as opposed to just for that short time that I was there. Um, so, yeah, with the pandemic, there hasn't been able to be a trip down to Columbia for the Silver Service Children's Foundation. We're still collecting donations, um, and it's something that I think is awesome. And anybody that is has the capacity to go down or get involved in some sort of volunteer um, excursion, it really is life-changing. And it gives you a very deep appreciation for our healthcare system as flawed as people think it is and there are flaws in any healthcare system i am truly grateful to be a physician and surgeon in america with all the amazing resources we have here yeah that's fantastic and you know it's a uh... I have dear friends, Mike Redler is another uh, orthopedic surgeon in Connecticut that routinely goes down. And just people that have done it and do it are just so, so proud of, of what they've done and what they've accomplished. And it just becomes a habit. They can't stop. They just keep going on, a, on an annual basis. So thank you so much for sharing. But, you know, uh, Rana, it's, it's really a pleasure to have you on. This is what we love to do on the Ortho Show podcast, bring incredibly unique orthopedic surgeons from around the world who can share their story. Uh, the chutzpah to go into solo practice in the, in the great mecca of Los Angeles and orthopedics is really <laughs> tremendous. We're very, really proud of you for having accomplished that. We, I get a sense that you're going to be quite successful in whatever endeavors you choose. So thank you so much for, for joining us today. Thank you. I appreciate uh, the time and I'm glad I could make it. Fantastic. This is Dr. Scott Sigmund, hashtag follow the pro, host of the ortho show. Till next time.